So I'm Ryan Schmidt. I'm a Texas Parks and Wildlife Biologist in the Edwards Plateau Wildlife District. I work in Edwards and Valverde Counties. That's Rock Springs and Del Rio. Today we're going to talk about behavioral snaring of feral hogs. It's kind of a little pet project I've been doing for 15 years looking at it, and in the last four or five I think I've developed a technique that's fairly effective, and it utilizes a structure that you have on your ranches, utility poles. Now, uh, there's a disclaimer I'd like to talk about. Before you do any of these process on your, you, on your poles, contact a utility company to see if it's all right to do this. Uh, they may not approve of it, but explain to them that this technique lessens their serviceability if, if well, the hogs lessen the serviceability of those poles. So anything you can do to keep those feral hogs from rubbing on them, and I've been all over the state, some of these poles are rubbed in two. So it saves you money, saves utilities money. So it's a, it's a good effective way, and also as far as wildlife management controlling feral hogs. So we, I'm not going to go into all the issues that feral hogs do on properties. We all know what happens, but just to cover a few things, you had added expenses to your operations that you're currently doing on your property. Sometimes it's expensive equipment. If you're shooting them and using thermal, you're using night vision, they can be real expensive. The traps, the cell phone activated traps can be expensive. Your time, that's really important is time. We all know that. Of course, feral hogs damage fencing, round water gaps, underneath fences, they destroy it, has to be replaced. It causes losses of either your livestock or your wildlife getting out of your property. Of course, we always want to talk about the possible diseases that are associated with feral hogs that they can spread around via water sources or to your livestock, to your wildlife that you have. Of course, we know the losses. The greatest concern that we have is the loss of habitat. Feral hogs destroy grasslands. They destroy in and around forbs, weeds that we feed our wildlife and livestock with. Feed, if you're supplemental feeding your wildlife, they consume a lot of it. Not in taking it away from your wildlife and your, and your livestock. Direct predation of wildlife, that's a known fact that it does happen. Turkey and quail nests, they destroy those. Same thing with livestock. There's a lot of direct correlation of predation by feral hogs on livestock, especially the young. And then damaging water sources, springs, tanks, those sort of things, float valves, all of these water sources can be damaged by feral hogs. So we need to do whatever we can to control. What I want to present today is a tool, is a tool of behavioral snaring of those feral hogs on utility poles. Some of those tools, traps, like I said, they could be cell phone activated traps, head gates, that sort of thing. Toxicants, of course, those are in the limelight right now. Everybody's talking about warfarin and sodium nitrite, but of course they're pending. They need approval by USDA, the FDA, to be able to use these things, and we're in the process of getting that approved, but it's a limited tool. Shooting, as I talked about before, can be expensive. If it's not done in, I would say, a rhythmic or, or a, a constant shooting uh, venue, then it's just recreational. You're not impacting any population reduction by using shooting. Aerial gunning with or aerial gunning with helicopters, that's another effective tool. But if it's only done once a year, twice a year, you're not really impacting into those populations. Those feral hogs are immigrating, immigrating out of your property. So it can be effective, but is it done and it's expensive. Then the conventional snaring on your fence lines is traditionally where snaring is conducted, but it does tear up those fences. So back 12 years ago or so, I started this endeavor to look at it, and of course it progressed. I was looking at feral hog sign across the state where I was traveling, and during a, as I was a biologist in school, I noticed that, or like Lake Granger, I've had utility poles completely worn down, you know, 12 inch diameter poles that are worn down to two inches in diameter by feral hogs. So I kept in my back of my mind, there's got to be a way to catch feral hogs on that. Well, AgriLife put a publication together, Snaring Feral Hogs, in September of 2009. I read it backwards and forwards. Hey, that's a great idea to catch them on utility poles. Build those snares. That's a great thing. However, I had a lot of questions in my mind. How do they do it? Why are they attracted to it? Placement of that snare. They gave a small little demonstration, a wire, and a few things on there, and it really didn't explain a lot, so I had a lot of questions. So I set out at that point when I started working for the department in 2008, 
push forward. Let's play with this. Let's work with it. Try to get me to the point where I am now. And if I wouldn't have taken that direction, I wouldn't be here today. So let's converse and look at two alternative tools. Traps. A little as $300 for a head gate, and you build your own pen. You can purchase at your farm and ranch store to $6,000 and plus dollars for a cell phone activated camera trap that, dro- that catches the entire sander, or so we think. A lot of times you have wildlife and livestock issues that are associated with those traps. You're baiting, you're putting corn or some sort of bait in those traps, so you're catching livestock and you're catching your wildlife, so it resources at the same time. So sometimes it's not effective. Of course, with those traps is baiting, like I covered before. You're putting corn down on there, and sometimes these traps are not effective. That non-target catch, and I'm a big believer in not catching those non-targets. It's, it just upsets me when you're catching animals you're not intended to, and a lot of that happens both snaring and with traps. How many times we've caught a deer in a box trap, and it bounces around and plays pinball inside of it. There's a lot of people shaking their heads. It happens quite often, and that's because of baiting. So snaring is a low-cost alternative. The basic setup, less than $500, but that will give you 40 or plus snares that you can put out, say, on utility poles or on fences or even on in trees, and I'll show some, you know, later on I'll show some uh, examples of that. When set effectively, you'll have low non-target catches. And I mean low numbers of non-target animals, deer, livestock. Uh, No baiting is required. You're catching those animals when they're moving through. That's what's best about it. A lot of times, like I said, conventionally it's used on fencing, but I started to explore using it on utility poles. So you ask, why utility poles? Plain and simple, feral hogs use them. If you're not looking at your utility poles, you're not looking at the feral hog issues that you have on your property. I believe, and this is from my observations, it's a behavioral adaptation. They're associated with a vertical structure. It might be parasite control, the insecticides that they put in a utility pole to keep fungus and bugs, insects out of the pole. The hogs have learned to use that creosote or that coal tar that they treat the poles with. Various locations around the state use various formulations, but it's still the same. They're using the poles for to remove those parasites. Grooming. Rub mud off. They go to a water hole. They get caliche. They get mud on them. They can use to get get the mud off, use the pole. That's that vertical structure. Another thing that I have noticed in my observations, the, the adult boars are using the poles as a scent station to advertise their status, their location, maybe even to garner territory via these utility poles. And then the sows come and check them out, and then maybe they implant some sort of scent, pheromones in the area. A a boar can come back and check it. Multiple camera pictures of one solitary boar coming to one pole at a time or working a set of poles. So I think there might be some scent issues there that the hogs are impacting or imparting on the utility poles. One, it's a natural attractant. You have them there, they're on your easements. Nothing you can do to put them there unless you want to put a pole out there specifically for them. They'll probably use it. No baiting, great use for utility poles. You don't have to bait. Little or no non-target use. I've got tens, 20,000 pictures of no wildlife, mind you, wildlife using utility poles. They walk by them, they use the easements for movement corridors but they're not using them like feral hogs do. So I'll I'll put a disclaimer in this. The properties that I'm I'm using this on do not have livestock. I would say because this is a lethal method and the snare is sticking out off the pole, that livestock could be impacted by this technique. So my advice is when you're rotating your animals through, if you're rotating them through each pasture, pull the snares up out of the way. When the animals are gone, put it back down again. I haven't had any pictures of white-tailed deer, axis, or any of the other ungulates that are out there. Don't know a lot about javelina. I'm trying to work with the guys in South Texas to see if javelina are using utility poles the same way that feral hogs do. That's an ongoing, ongoing quest. It's a positive capture point. A lot of times people are shooting feral hogs. The feral hogs run off. You don't know where they're at. They could have wandered, got into a water source, and died. 
when you catch him on a fer- when you catch him on a utility pole, that feral hog is not going anywhere. It's staying right there. A lot of times you have to dispatch it, but that feral hog is staying at the pole. You can drag it out, get it out of the way. Of course, all these easements are in a straight line. If you look in that lower right hand corner, those utility poles are in a straight line, and you can drive up to them with a spotting scope, a pair of binoculars, and you can check every snare on that pole without having to drive down there. Saves time, saves fuel. So in five years of snaring, my non-tar catches, one white-tailed deer, no mortality, we got it out. Of course, I moved that snare off of that because it was on a game trail, and I covered that in placement. Two axis deer, and I had one mortality. That was unfortunate, but I changed the orientation of the snare, and I think... I have eliminated that or at least lessened the chances of catching them. Basically, it was perpendicular to the travel, and I'll cover that in placement two. One Barbado sheep, that was on a trail too, so that snare got moved. And then four vultures. Of course, I got complacent. You're going to catch vultures if you don't move the carcass away from the utility pole. Vultures bounce around, feed on that carcass. They're going to get into that snare. And, of course, I come up on them. I released all of them. There was no mortality, so there's no issues. But move that carcass 50, 75 yards away from the utility pole to eliminate those those issues. Got a little video here. Hopefully it works. Uh, that'll show you feral hog use on these poles. Hope everybody can see this. Yeah, it'll work. So you can see the young using it and an adult sow, a breeding age sow. Of course, I have two snares on that pole as a double, but it shows them using it. They hit it and they run, and the whole sounder will use that pole, the whole sounder. And I'll I'll, I'll run that again in case you want to see it. But in this sounder, there was about 12, 13 hogs in this sounder, and each one of them visited the pole just like it. They hit it and run, and they go to the next one. And it was like it was single file. Of course, my technique, and that's the advance of technology nowadays, we can use cameras and I can modify my technique to better and more effectively catch these feral hogs. First I had one snare on it, then I put two snares on it. Maybe I need to put three and four snares on it to keep them from, or to catch them. But that's, that's a work in progress. So I want to talk about snare construction first. Um, I build, my, I build my own snares. I don't buy them. I buy the components, and, I, and that's what I'm going to show you today is how I build them and where you can get locally supply and buy these components to build your own. But you can see I work off the back of my truck, and everything there, my snare building station, is on the back of the truck. I can build it in the pasture if I need to, but it's right there. And a lot of these tools I've made myself, and feel free to use the same. You can take pictures of them and use them. I do it because I want to control feral hogs. That's my passion. That's what I want to do. And this is what I do on my off time. Of course, all these materials I sourced, and I wouldn't say I didn't buy them all myself, but as a biologist working for the state, don't have a whole lot of funds. But I do this because I want to do it, and I funded it myself. So I try to keep the cost down, and you'll see the cost savings when you build your own snares in, in later in the, in the presentation. But most of these materials can be purchased online at a trapping supply store. So you can go on, log on, buy the materials, and I'll have a materials list that you can get a picture of, or, or you can ask me later on the materials list. Or you can go down to your local trapping supply, or go down to your local farm and ranch store and buy the wire, which is the last components of this. So I'll, I'm going to be a little specific in the materials I use, but construction is integral to this modular system that, I, that I've come up with that seems to be fairly effective. So here, just a little bit of the, the materials and tools that I use. Of course, I can't emphasize enough the cable cutters. They're specifically designed to, kit, to cut cable. You can use wire cutters. They're not as effective. They crush the cable. But the cable cutters are probably very important. The 14-gauge snare support wire, I make that myself. The nut driver and the countersink, those facilitate putting the, the, uh, the snare on the utility pole. The double ferrules, you buy that from a trapping supply. The same thing with that, in, that MB or Minnesota brand heavy-duty inline swivel. It's important to have a swivel in that system. But if you'll note, 
The eyes are bigger than you would normally be on a trapping swivel, and I create those by bending them around a 5 16 bolt, and that's to allow that 3 16 quick link to pass through and to connect the entire system together. But that Minnesota brand crunch proof swivel, as you note, are, w are welded. I've gone through swivels like you wouldn't believe, different kinds of swivels. The ones that you buy in the store, they have, they're made out of brass. They're called Roscoe swivels. They'll stretch them out. A large feral hog will stretch them out and become unserviceable. Then you have to start over. The best, essentially, you have to start over. So I did the research and found out this is the strongest swivel. I have yet to have one break. I've caught hundreds of feral hogs on the same swivel, the same type of swivel. The cam locks, they're reusable, and that's a part of this system is being reusable and keeping the cost down. That screw can be any screw, but it needs to be at least an inch and a quarter long, and that attaches it to the pole. And that inch and a quarter fence staple attaches the choker, which is this portion here, to the utility pole at about a five or six foot level height to keep it from sliding down. The quick link and then that snare support collar. That snare support collar made out of 17 gauge wire. Again, I make that myself and I'll show you how I do that. The nut driver itself, uh, it just makes putting snares in quickly. I can put a snare in in about three minutes and take a feral hog out and replace it in 30 seconds. That's how fast it is. In, in, in the whole scheme of snare trapping is speed. Get in and out and go. So the material cost. Now these numbers are rounded up, but this is just one of the large online suppliers you can buy these materials from. And I went with 500 feet because it'll give you about 40 snares at $3 a snare. So you can see those are the components that you're going to need. If you'll notice down there that 20 penny bright nail, that's my mandrel that I make the snare support collars and the snare support wires on. So it, it, it'll come into context in a little bit, but everything else, the wire you can buy at your farm and ranch stores. Everything else is available at your trapping supply uh, online vendors. So roughly $350 you can get started. And once you have these components, you can build multiples, but you'll have to buy more wire. And I'd recommend that you buy at least a 1,000 foot, then the cost savings go down even further. So snare construction. We'll talk about a snare and a, and a term that I've coined because this is what I've come up with as a choker that puts it up on top of the utility pole and of course the components. Keep in mind this is a modular system. It consists of a lot of moving parts, but as you start to use this, a lot of this is reusable. This stays on the pole, the quick link and the swivel stays on the pole, and then the snare itself is what you're going to replace when you catch a feral hog. I would recommend that you replace the snare on every animal you catch because why take the chance of missing an animal if it's kinked and it doesn't perform like it's supposed to. So as the snare goes, on mine, my tailgate is my length. It's 57 to 60 inches. I use two double ferrules to crimp the snare to keep it in place, and that's my snare component right there. That's all 57 inches. It's very minimal, and the cost is low. That cam lock and, of course, the 17-gauge snare support collar itself is what they call it. So cable has a natural curvature to it. When you get it off the spool and you cut your section, it's got a natural curvature. We're going to enhance that curvature to make it round, and I'll show you the loading process. You'll see that on a lot of Internet videos of how to load a snare, but it has a curvature, and, and recognize that curvature is there. We're going to enhance that when we build our snares. I start by taking one of those double aluminum ferrules, placing it through one side. Note the orientation of the cam lock snare. That's what's critical. If it's upside down and the flat portion is pointing down, what will happen is your snare will not close. It will stay open. So note the orientation. The curvature of the snare is in this direction and the double ferrule is through there. So I take the, this material right here, put it into my swedge tool, and I crimp it. And I pull that excess material as tight as I can get it. I want to impart some friction on that cam lock. That friction holds that snare loop open. 
If it doesn't, it flops down, it's in the pig's face, and they have a tendency to push it out of the way, and then you have what I call a knockoff situation. Then you have to reset it every time. But I don't crimp once, don't crimp twice. If you go and buy commercial snares, you'll look at them. They might be crimped once, they might be crimped twice, or they're smashed flat. You're not going to get the holding power. Engineers designed these crimpers to collapse that aluminum ferrule around that snare cable for the strongest closure, strongest uh, possible. So it has about 1,100 to 1,000 pounds of braking force. And when you use switch fittings, the, the switch tool and these uh, double ferrules, they hold about 80 to 90 percent of the cable's braking strength. So it's well, in, it's, it's well strong enough to hold any feral hog. I have yet to have one break when it's crimped properly. Of course, again, crimp three times. Note the orientation of the snare, the snare uh, cam lock here. And this is the curvature. And it's, it's parallel. So if you could see that, it's parallel to the curvature of the snare and that's going to become evident when we load it in the next video so here at my station that I have I've created and put a used a 5 8 rod and this is how I load my snares the, the cam lock is in my left hand and I pull that snare through so once I've verified that the snare is round and it's roughly in a 28 inch diameter snare if it's round I'm satisfied with it I add the snare support collar and then another double ferrule and I crimp it down and I leave a loop small, uh, small enough that I can pass the quick link through it as you can see here it's about inch in diameter or so when it's spread out so I leave just enough that the snare can actually uh, that the quick link can actually attach the modular system together. And now this is a completed snare. It's a little smaller, but now I, I coil them up so I can transport them easily. Instead of having them all over the place, I put them in a little carabiner. It's easy to transport them. I usually do mine by four-wheeler. It's a lot easier. So the choker, the same build, the same way, except you're not loading it but you're not adding a cam lock to it. You're adding that welded swivel to it and then a hole and then that loop, what I call the choker loop, is big enough to pass that, uh, pass that swivel through. Because you're taking it apart here at the quick link, when you put it on the utility pole, it thread through itself and that's what we call a choker. It's 84 inches, seven feet of 7x19 seven or 7x7 seven seven cable. I like the more flexible 7x19 cable. It seems to perform better on the, on the utility pole. Two aluminum ferrules and of course that crunch proof swivel. It's very simple to put that together. Um, this portion are the materials that I created and to come up with a positive locking point on the utility pole. These I make myself in the snare support collars which are right here, that snare support collar, are my own invention, my own necessity to figure out what I needed to get it to stay on that utility pole. There's, I tried wire, I tried every, every else thing out on the market, and it didn't work the way I wanted to, so I, this is how I build my stuff. I start off and I make, I, I take a, a four, that 20 penny nail and I drill a hole in the end of it probably here to accept that 14 gauge wire now you can build this little setup right here really easy out of 3 8 rod and I did that but initially I started using a drill to wrap these snare support wires I found that you know it started working on my hands pretty hard so I, I made a tool to make it better I used 12 or 13 inches of and it's the length of this station that I created, so that's how I cut my wire, so I don't have a lot of waste. 12 to 13 inches, I insert it in that hole I drilled, and then I start wrapping about four to five wraps, and then I stop. I take a pair of wire cutters, 
and I cut this end off right here, and then the whole snare support just slides right off the quote-unquote mandrel. The snare collar itself, I take 17-gauge wire and I pull out four or five feet of it and use the same tool and insert it into the mandrel, and I start wrapping. And I make a long coil, approximately about four inches long. And this will make four or five snare support collars out of that 17-gauge wire. Same thing. I cut with a pair of wire cutters that piece of wire that I inserted into the, into the mandrel. And I slide the whole coil off. Then that coil, I separate into three-eighths to half-inch segments that I can cut off and put on the snare when I build it. I'll do that right there. So that little snare collar, snare support collar is right there. And then, of course, the snare support wire there at the bottom. So I take that with me wherever I go in case I need to build another one or I need to replace this, which will happen. The feral hogs will rub that to the point they'll break it off. And then... I'll have to replace it. But it's quick, easy. Screw it in, screw it out in, you know, no time. Again, I want to emphasize the tools. I can't emphasize the cutters and the crimpers. They make your life a lot easier when building snares. And because of the multi-cavity on this particular model, you can crimp to 16th inch cable for like coyotes, 332nd, 8th inch, all the way up to quarter inch. And then the cutters. These are Felco C7 cutters. Uh, they make a larger version of this, which is also better. Uh, it gives you a lot more leverage to cut cable. Snare placement. This I had to play with. In that September 2009 publication, they didn't give a lot of information. Yes, it could be six inches off the ground, but they really didn't talk about diameter or anything like that or location where a snare needs to be placed. This is what I had trial and error over the last four or five years. Finally perfected it. Snare placement. You want a snare or trap anywhere where you see sign. There's no point in putting a snare on a utility pole or a tree that doesn't have any sign on it. So you can see here that it's a tree, utility pole, it doesn't matter. I still use the same. I avoid game trails for the reason of non-target catches. You can put that snare, if this is a game trail, you can put that snare in line here to keep it out of the game trail. It limits your non-target catches. Feral hogs will circle that entire pole. Yeah, you might lose a little, but they'll circle that entire pole rubbing. Now, there's some brush on Agarita on the back side of this one. It's considered a blocking agent, so it kind of funnels that pig to go through this direction right here. But I limit uh, my placement parallel to roads and trails, not perpendicular to them, because that's the travel they're going through. And you don't want to, you know, like I said, I don't want to catch non-target livestock or even wildlife. This is what they didn't cover, and this is what I have to find out over the last three, four years. You see the mud line right here? That's the shoulder of a pig. Remember my video where that hog was rubbing on that utility pole? Well, that's what they're rubbing. I kind of lined it out here, and I put a piece of rope back again. But this is what you want to concentrate on. And it's roughly 20 inches. That's the tape measure pushed to the ground. Roughly around 19 to 21 inches is where those feral hogs are rubbing, depending upon the size of the pig. If any, anything higher than 25 inches, it's not feral hogs using that utility pole. I marked this up here because feral hogs will rub their cheek and their jowls, scratching. And sometimes you'll see markings up here, but it's way too high. That's 28, 29 inches. So I take my countersink about an inch or two above that rub line. I drill in with a countersink because I want to set that screw and that snare support wire into the utility pole. I want it so it's flush, and I want it out of the way of the pig because they concentrate on that point and they'll rub, and they'll rub, and they'll break it off. But I want it there because now that snare is going to be right where the head is. That head's going to be right here on that pig, right where their shoulder's at. They walk right into the snare, get caught. 
and we're there. So, like I said, the tools, the screw, the snare support collar, and then there's the the uh, little focused in port where you can see right at about one inch above at 21 inches. Now I take that snare wire, that snare support wire that I have there, and about three inches off of the pole, because it's out vertical, I take a pair of pliers, I put a V in it, and that's just the support wire to give it a little more spring. And when I do that, that gives me the ability to move that snare down to here, to here. It gives me more than four to five inches of movement when that snare, at that point right there, that I can move that snare up and down the pole based on the size of the hog. So you can adjust where the hog's at. A lot of other techniques, they use wire. You've got to tie the wire off, move it. A lot of times that wire will get loose, and it'll fall down, and your whole snare system will fall to the ground. Here, it's positive, and you can move it up and down. Once again, here's the snare. Now, what I do is I come off that snare collar or that, that, uh, that ferrule right there, and I come down about two to three inches, and I take a pair of pliers, and I bend that snare at about a 90-degree angle. Before I had the snare hanging down to the side, either side, and what it was doing is cause my snare, instead of being parallel with the, the tree or parallel to the pole like this, it'd have a taco effect, and it, it'd be at a C. And it wasn't effective. The hogs were pushing it out of the way. So the more vertical and parallel to that pole I can get that, that snare, the more effective it became. So it just puts a little more tension on this snare to get it to close faster course the snare lock position is extremely important this being 12 o'clock I want it at 1 or 11 depending upon which side of the snare you're on that snare lock needs to have some force when the hog hits it it'll close on that feral hog you need to have it at 1 or 11 if it's at 12 you'll have those knockoff situations all the time and it's frustrating I went through that and of course here's a close-up of it and of course you can see my loop it's anywhere from six to eight. Because of the, the position of that tape, it doesn't really show. But you want the bottom of your loop six to eight inches off the ground. That's about the leg height of a feral hog when they're, when they're rubbing on the pole. So as a completed snare, the choker, once again, you put the wire through the choker loop. You attach your quick link that ties the whole system together. The swivel, and you've already set your snare. This one's ready to go. Go to the next one. Simple. And here that seven feet, you know, relates out to about five or six feet high. On the back side of this snare loop or this choker loop, I put that staple, that fence staple. That fence staple keeps that choker from falling down. And I learned long ago, you get it up high, you take the motor away from that pig. When you catch him, that pig comes up off the ground and he doesn't break this cable. When I was using 332nd cable and messing around with it, I'd have my choker right here. They'd break it. They'd break 8th inch cable. So since I moved it up high, I have yet to have one break it. They've all pulled them off the ground. So replacement costs. Now this is just materials. But the bottom portion of that snare, because you're recycling the cam lock and the snare collar, if you can, this is only about a penny. It's not even worth measuring. But the cam lock being 38 cents or so, the double ferrule, and the cable is what you're replacing on it. So that's 61 cents per pig. And in our circles, in animal damage control, that's pretty cheap. Uh, can't even get a bullet for that, I don't think. So you're replacing that. Of course, that's not considering time and labor, but that's just material cost. So some, might, some of, and of course this 38 didn't include in 2015 and 16. It was only in 2017 I had 38 snares out. But you can see my numbers slowly started to increase. And of course, we're halfway through July in 2018. I'm on track to catch 90 or so pigs a year. Now, these numbers are small. It's because of the property I'm on. You know, it's, it's, it's moderately sized, but I've started to expand out on other landowners, and I'm averaging about one to two pigs a week on the snares, and that's 38, 40 snares. It's not the numbers 
but right here, 70% of my catches are adult pigs. If you want to make inroads into a population, you remove the adults out of the breeding population. That is what I'm thinking is the key to removing feral hogs, is taking adult breeding, breeding animals out of that population. You can use traps, you can catch smaller pigs, you can catch all the little ones you want to, but if you don't remove the adults, they're just making more babies. And my breakdown during the year, I catch male boar, boar hogs in the spring and the fall. I'm still trying to figure out why I'm catching them then. I think it has to do with breeding, but it's spring and fall. The summer, it's all sows. And I have caught piglets. That 30% is piglets. I'm down to 10 pounders. In that big of a loop, I've caught 10 pounders. But as you can see here, this is that same pig. I don't have video of it. It's in still photo. But she has the snare on her right now. And she hasn't realized it. And this is 10 seconds later. Pulls her up off the ground. It, it, it's doing what it's supposed to do. It takes the motor away from that pig. It's recoverable. They don't break it. I thank you for attending. And I think we got time for questions. Yeah, we got time for questions. If anybody has any questions. What's that? You can. You can set two snares per pole. Um, I use just kind of a simple harness, but I found that on my cameras, one hog will get on one side and rub opposite of the snare. I don't know why they're avoiding it. Maybe it's because it's in their way. I don't think it's an issue of them seeing the, seeing the snares. They have poor eyesight. Maybe it's they're smelling it. I take my snares and I leave them in the back of the truck trying to get the, snare, get the scent off of them. But a lot of times I put them up, I'm going, they might have some scent on them. So to eliminate that, I put two snares on it. Sometimes I take a blocking material, put a rock or a cedar stump right here, and it makes them rub on that one side of the pole and it can become effective. Those blocking agents work pretty good. But I, normally I use one snare because, like I said, those hogs will circle, circle that pole. Yes, sir? He's asking about the order of the crimp when I'm crimping my snares. I don't like a tag in at the back of my snare. So what I do is I start on the very first, on the closest to me, and then I move to the outside, and then I, and then I crimp in the middle. It's outside, inside, in, in between. I set, when you crimp on the outside, you set it first. So it's not going to pull in. If you crimp it here first, it'll actually pull that tag in inside the crimp, and then you won't have full coverage. Yes, sir. Yes and no. I've got pictures of one pig where he's missed a snare on one side, and then he goes to the next snare down, and I've caught him on camera and caught that pig on the next utility pole. I don't know if it's because the sense imparted on there, or he knows that it's there. Uh, I had one boar that I was working in February, January, February. I had him on camera January and February, March. And then finally in April, I changed my technique up and put a foot snare in the ground to catch him. He was avoiding the snare. He would rub on one side. Then I put two. He'd rub in between. Finally had enough of that watching him come back the same pig to the pole. I put on uh, a foot snare, uh, Fremont, and caught him on, in, yeah, in April. Four months later, same pig. The reason I know it was the same pig because he was a spotted big pig. So I don't know if they're avoiding it. If it's avoidance, I don't see it as much. But I do have some, like that one large pig that I caught in February or, or caught in April with the foot snare. I did not have another pig visit that until the middle of June. Um, this was in April, and yes. It can impart some avoidance. We're seeing that in traps. We're seeing even the sodium nitrite trials that if you don't catch the entire sounder, you can impart some avoidance. They're learning. These pigs are smart. So will it? Yes. Uh, that was in April. I, caught, I had these pictures. It was, it was about the middle of May before pigs revisited this pole. But by the time I got to this sow, she was dead and... The vulture did scattered everything I had sent all around the station. Sometimes it's an issue. A lot of times it's not. I've caught pigs there. They've died. I've shot them, blood all over the place. And then a day later, I catch another pig on the same location. 
So it's it's not consistent. I'm not seeing avoidance. There might be a little bit, but I'm just not seeing you know measurable amount of avoidance. <laughs> not yet, not yet. We're in the we're going to put that probably on our web page on on, a, on the Parks and Wildlife web page for the Hill Country District. But I want to get it together, kind of showing everything. I just don't have it yet. You, one second, sir. You could. You could. Um, by state law, you're supposed to be checking these snares every 18 hours. With this technique, if you catch a pig that night, usually that hog doesn't choke itself down. So you can take it out of there. But certainly you can put a stop in it, but you're going to be limiting the size of pig that you're going to catch. So if you want to catch larger pigs, market pigs, you could probably do that if you put a stop on it. The uh, physical nature of a pig, though, they might slip that snare off if it's not locking tight. But when that snare is on a pole like this, it puts a, not much tension on them, so you might be able to recover them for, for a market sale. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I don't have them for sale. I, I didn't. I didn't put that put that in here. But but that's why I was. You could you could uh, you could make these yourself, or you know you, I'll be around and I can give you more instruction if if you need to. Yes, ma'am. No, not yet. The idea has been floated. Uh, she was asking about placing utility poles, not ones that are freestanding, but using utility poles to try to attract pigs and maybe maybe snare them on them, or just use them as an attractant. Or you just don't have any. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the, you know, checking your snares at a regular basis is, is, is required. Sure, sure. You could do that. Or around your tanks, if they're rubbing on the existing mesquite trees that are there. I've got one set on the river right now that's on a mesquite tree that they're rubbing on. So, so you could certainly, and this is a tree next to a caliche tank in Edwards County on another landowner's property, but I've got three of them set in this Oakmont, and it's already caught four pigs in, in less than, like, three weeks. Mm -hmm. No, I built a harness, and I didn't bring it today because I don't know the effectiveness of having that one. I mean, yes, you're increasing your catch by, by maybe half, but it's simply just taking cable and wrapping it around and I use another quick link at the top but I have two drops with two swivels on it and that's what I attach my snares to that was that double that you saw in there I, I've, I'm still working on it as you can see they they twist and pull on there's a lot of force generated on that on that that double if I can I'm still in the process of building a double that's going to be survivable so to speak to feral hogs yes sir no, that's why I contact them before I did this, and, and we happened to use PEC, and I contacted the field supervisor, and I asked him if he was being a problem, and he's like, no. He's like, I don't have any issues with it because, like I said, it reduces the serviceability. Most of these poles have a 40 or 50 year life on them, and feral hogs can reduce them down to 20, 30 years. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I've been talking with my district supervisor. It'll probably be this summer, um, but but it'll be out. And if you've liked our Facebook page with the Hill Country Wildlife, um, more than likely we're going to post it there, at least the YouTube link that it can go to YouTube, and, and I'll, I'll try to get it out there. I'll create a channel that, that'll have this on it. And, of course, my endeavors out there when I'm doing this. Because my, my properties are increasing that I'm doing this on. A lot of them are MLD cooperators that I work with. So, you know, I ask them if I can do it. They're all for it. And they get a benefit of removing a few feral hogs. Okay, thank y'all. Mark your calendar now for next year's Texas Wildlife Association 34th Annual Convention. Coming up July 11th through 14th of 2019 in San Antonio. This is a production of Roland Recording.